Cavs. But first, before all of that, it is Super Bowl week. Happy Super Bowl season yeah. to all who celebrate from FanDuel America's number one sports book. If you're like me, placing bets on Super Bowl Sunday is the absolute best. It's a necessity, along with grabbing a great seat on the couch to watch the game and grabbing your favorite football snacks and FanDuel's here to help you not just win one, but win two, three, four, even more bets. We're going to put together an ultimate same-game parlay on UCSS throughout the week, which will start in about an hour here. Not only can you bet on who will win the Super Bowl this season, but FanDuel also has bets for which players will score a touchdown, how many points will be scored, and so much more. Right now, new, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if their first bet of $5 or more wins. So visit FanDuel.com slash UCSS to sign up. That's FanDuel.com slash UCSS. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook sponsor of the NFL. And today's winning ticket comes from our guy, Akron Dre Day. He won three separate same-game parlays in the nice. Utah-Philadelphia game last week. In total, the three parlays added up to equal $1,139.65. The one he sent us here was the smallest of the three, plus 3,200 odds. He won $826 on a $25 bet. That was one of his parlays. The other parlay turned 15 into 154. He had a third, but you can only show two Dang. tweets on Twitter. So shout out to Akron Dre Day for a massive mm. payday. And speaking of Today the NBA, was a good guys. Day. By the way, Big Nuggets, I won twice this weekend. At a boy. Dude. Wait a minute. Are your 20 late parlays? Nah, I got a new joint. I got a new setup. You got a new joint. I got a new joint. Someone, someone hit up, hit up the show last week, and I saw your eyes light up like Christmas trees. So you know what's crazy? They, shout out to FanDuel. They got this thing. I don't. I don't even want to say it because I feel like they're gonna stop discontinuing it right when I'm hot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't be playing around. You got to go through the FCC to do that, man. Don't be playing around with the odds, guys. But they got this thing where you can bet during the game. Live sure. betting. And, and so the live betting is I'm over here. I hit twice on the over-under and on the point spread. So what I did is Probably I... not big paydays, right? Oh, here's what I did. I pulled up. I'm like, okay. Oh, so you went against the first half trend. I, 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 I waited to the fourth quarter. I saw the trends. I'm saying, okay, well, they ain't about to hit no over-under. I'm looking at the po the points or whatever. And I'm like, all right, well, let me go with the under on this one. Then I'm looking at the point spread. I'm like, mm, eh, this this 12, 13, this could be down to eight. I'm going to go with the point spread. So I did that for two games. That was in tow at, in the fourth quarter. And you're right. You can't, you can't, you're not going to get rich off of it. It's like five or ten bucks. Right. But I said, oh, no, well, let, here's what I'm going to do. This guarantee, give me a hundred. So I put a hundred on, on the point spread in the fourth quarter. It's like five minutes left for the Jazz and the um, and the Bucks. And guess what? You Easy hit. money. Yeah. Oh, like six hundred. Yeah. Really? Six hundred. Yeah. Just you got six to one odds on a money line. A money point? line in the fourth quarter. Live, live betting is the cheat code. My, it's the cheat. My I'm friend, like, the, the one ticket that we showed that my friend hit that 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 long parlay he hit. He put thirteen dollars on that at halftime. Of that particular football game and won over a thousand dollars. Oh yeah, we had his ticket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So like, I, I ain't never starting. One. I ain't starting no more before the game. I might get no, no. I'm gonna wait all halftime game. Oh, I'm, wow. I, could, I could not believe that. So I saw someone sent in a ticket last yep. week, and you were like, "What?" I said, "What?" I might be on to something. I said, "You he on to something?" All right. Kid. Yeah. Shout out to Very Fargo, good. by the way. Don't I can tell you this uh, from the sports fans that I run into. Sports gambling is absolutely massive in this crowd. We read the numbers last week. Seven and a half billion dollars wagered in Ohio in one year. I yeah. can see it. Seven and a half B. And I, I can see it too because everybody that I ran into over the weekend wanted to know what's what's the what's the spread on the Super Bowl? Which right. way are you going? Right. What do you think about I, you know, McCaffrey will score an anytime touchdown. Well, I, people are talking about this like never before. We're, we're hey, going to do Nuggets. segments all throughout the week. All right, so. McNuggets. Speaking What's of FanDuel, I think I'm going to take the over on Evan Mobley threes tonight. Ah, well, that's a great place to start. Wow, good transition. Saturday, I'm taking the over. <laughs> on Careful Saturday, now. One Evan game Mobley. does not make a trend. <laughs> Saturday, Mobley made three threes. First time in his career he had done that. Guys, is this a one-game blip in the radar for Mobley or a turning point? in the young power forward's career as he progresses and hopefully transforms into what Someone thinks it's a turning point. Into the I, I, no, no, no. It could be. I, for me, 
I don't think that this one game is is a turning point for his entire career, but I do think that this game could be a confidence builder in him improving his three point shooting. Evan Mobley is what twenty four percent career, twenty four percent from three in his career, and twenty four games <coughs> this year. One game took him up over thirty five percent for his career. For, for, I for, mean, for, for the season, but yeah, yeah. and and totality, man. Three point field goals made yesterday was his career high. He's never attempted. More Saturday. than uh, Saturday, he's never attempted more than six in a game, and he did that last year against Toronto. How many of those did he hit? Do you remember? I think he hit two. Two. So I mean, looking at it, I, I don't feel like that Evan Mobley is going to transform into some three-point assassin. I think it's good to see him hit his shots. I know this was a two-part question of is this a turning point in his career? No, and I don't think that him being a three-point shooter, based off that raises the calf ceiling because if we go by the numbers, which is a McNuggets thing, it's not really my thing. Yeah. Three point field goals made being three was his career high yesterday. So he's never made more than two in the game. Let's split it. Say he makes one, maybe two at most. Yeah. That's six points. That's way, I mean, a margin of victory in the NBA is way higher than that. Sure. So it's not, I don't think it does anything to raise the Cleveland Cavaliers ceiling, but if Evan Mobley can just develop and play more consistently around the board, as far as defensive uh, defensiveness, like, you know, just asserting itself, yeah. you know, hitting the knockdown shots, things are like that. I think that raises the calf ceiling more than him being a quote-unquote three-point shooter. Yeah, gee, what do you think? I mean, it's one game, well, but it listen, was impressive. Wemby, Wemby's <clears> long, <throat> hard to shoot over. I think one, 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 one thing that I think really helped him was the simple fact that you saw him going against Wemby, right? And I think he really took – that to heart. I thought the way he played, he came out aggressive. And I think Evan Mobley being very quiet, um, you may not know how he, how motivated he is, but I think he came out and wanted to show, him and Jared Allen wanted to come out and show, because they both outplayed Wimpy. They showed that, hey, look, you know, y'all calling him a unicorn, but we can get it done too. You know, both of them 28, 26 points, all of them over 10 point, two, over 10 rebounds. But specifically when you talk about his three-point shooting, I think this helps the Cavs based on one thing. And we talked about it before. It's confidence. When you hit three, three for three, it, what it does, it gives you the confidence to say, okay, I can hit that shot. And even if you don't hit three for three, even if you hit one three, or even if you're consistently taking that shot, what it does, it makes people respect you. You got to respect it now. They can't leave you alone. And he may not shoot over 40%. Heck, he might not. If he's 32%, I'll take that. If he can make people respect him, if he can make Wimby have to come out from the basket, if he can make other fours have to come out and guard that, it opens the floor for Donovan Mitchell drive it, and then you can still do some high-low stuff with Jared Allen. So for me, I, I, it was a good sign, not because he hit three for three and he's going to go three for three every game. It's because he saw, he saw the ball go through the, through the hole. It gives him a little more confidence. And now it can be a coaching point that JB and the staff can say, hey, look, Look how productive the team is when you can shoot that shot, and hopefully gives them a, more of a, 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 a you know incentive and, and confidence to take the shot if it's there. Well, for me, he obviously has to do it more than one game. One game right. is, is definitely not a trend. How many times have we seen things in the NBA and think that oh wow he had thirty points? Well, that could be yeah. a new baseline, and then it, you know that player never hits thirty again. So I, I'm definitely not ready to sit here and say that he's a bona fide three pointer. What I liked is, I think it was critical that he made the first one. Mm -hmm. That got us to number two. And the fact that he made his second one got us to number three. He has to have the shooter's mentality that I don't care if it goes in or not. Mm -hmm. I am going to take the shot because it absolutely changes the way the defense plays when I'm out here. They can't stand there and give him six, eight feet of space if he's dropping them like that, mm -hmm. they've got to respect that. And that's the whole idea of getting them out there to shoot. You want spacing. You want lanes. When you bring the defense out to the perimeter, it creates that. And the Cavs have shown over the last month that that's their best brand of basketball to play. When there's guys on the perimeter and there's all threats to make the three, things open up. And now you don't even really have to shoot the three. It's like having a nuclear weapon. It's a deterrent. I don't want to poke you in the bear. You might nuke me. <laughs> well, it's the same thing in basketball with perimeter defense and a guy like Evan Mobley who hasn't shown that he's got a nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. 
Intel starts getting out real quick. Oh, he's got a nuclear weapon. Well, now you got to defend him. You can't just let him stand there and nuke you all day if he if he's going to do that. So I loved it. I hope it's a sign of things to come. I understand where you're coming from, Earl. And you don't think it necessarily raises the ceiling, but see the, the mathematical formula is if you take ten three pointers mm-hmm. and you're hitting thirty percent out of those ten shots, you walked away with nine points. Mm-hmm. If you shoot ten of your shots, mid-range jumper to in, underneath the basket, and you're a 50% shooter, which he is, and you take 10 shots, you just scored 10 points. Mm -hmm. So it all becomes an efficiency quotient. It's how efficient can you be with those 10 shots versus 10 shots that you can find underneath. And it might well work out that he's not hitting, because you got to hit over 33% before you can turn those 10 threes into more than you can make on twos. Right. Yeah. Even if he doesn't reach that point, I'm okay with him doing it because there's all kinds of hidden benefits that won't show up on the scoreboard or in his box score. It's going to open space, create lanes, and give other guys an opportunity. So I'm, I'm anxious to get McNugget's thoughts on this. I hope it's a sign of things to come. And the fact that he shot three, I think, is pretty big. He hadn't taken three in a game all year, had he? I no, don't think he's, so. he's taking three of the game a couple. No, this uh, year. This year, he's taking. Three. Oh, he did. I, he's, I don't he's remember. Taking, he's taking three a few times. Okay. He's only played twenty four games. Right. But to your point, I, I definitely agree with what you said. The reason why I'm standing where I'm standing at with it, I think it's a confidence builder. Sure. Uh, like the way Mikey uh, posed the question was, does this game like like brings a point a turning point in his career? And yeah, not, I can't and, go there, and, and, and I, I don't can't think go there so. Yet. I but definitely man. think it's a confidence builder because even with him going three for three. The cast was still minus seven with him on the court. And so I'm encouraged to see him take these shots because you're right, it does spread the floor. It creates more room for other people to like maneuver. But for me, in order for the cast ceiling to be raised, I just need Evan Mobile to be more consistent. Right. And like, that's fair. Like be more consistent taking these good three point shots. I get it. Be more consistent on <clears throat> the defensive end of the floor. Be more consistent, like in asserting yourself underneath the rim and things like that. So just be more consistent. And to me, that does more to raise the Cavs ceiling than him like jacking up threes because I don't expect him to go three or three or three no, and six and things like that. So we, we talked about it a little bit. Um, implementing Mobley, implementing Garland right. more, right? They just came back and, and we talked about it. And I was texting Mike. I said, "Man, it look, I don't like this. It, it looked different." The, the game, the style of the game looked different. When they both first yeah, came when back. When they both came back. It slowed everything it, down. Now I look at it, it seems like Evan Mobley, he got the, he got the picture. He got the, the calling card. Because he's like, okay. He looked way more comfortable than what Darius Garland looked. He looked like he knew where he wanted to attack. He was aggressive. He looked like he knew where he wanted to get on the, on the floor in his spots. And, and, and he scored under the basket. He shot the threes. He, he extended the defense. But... It seems like Darius Garland is still trying to figure it out. I mean, when you look at it, I mean, he he, he hasn't even gotten four. He got four assists the last game, but look at the numbers. Four yeah. points, one of three. Um, the day before, the game before this, didn't even have four assists. He did, failed to get ten points. Um, so this is a second game in a row where it looked like he was kind of disinterested. Not disinterested, but not unsure of where he fit. Everybody else was moving. Donovan Mitchell playing with such confidence. Jared Allen is playing out of his mind. And then you get Evan Mobley to come in. Even Karis LeVert looks way more comfortable. And Garland is almost like, okay, where do I have the ball and how do I, how do I get guys involved? Because That's the Rubik's Cube they've that got to solve. Eight, eight assists. For, think about that. That means he's by the default. He's the playmaker now. He is now. And so, I think if nothing else during his injury, Garland's injury, like, I think they, they realize we got to go four out, one in. Mm-hmm. I also think they realize that this team is just better when Donovan has the ball in his hand and he's creating in the mm-hmm. front. Now, I think you're right, and I'm, I don't know if it's moping. I, I really want Mike to weigh in now because I don't know if he's moping because he's hearing all the chatter that he's not going to be the, the point guard and the playmaker, the primary ball handler on this team. I don't know what it is, but he, he right now seems to be the moving part that hasn't fit into this new style. I don't know how they do it. I don't know. Can they do it? Um, I don't know. So The, I, the numbers I, I'll say, and I'm a numbers guy. I don't think it's the end-all, be-all, but Garland, 
and Mitchell on the court together this season have a plus 9.2 net rating. So it's not the Cavs haven't been successful. It just looks different. It's kind of like the Flacco-Watson thing. Okay. The numbers are eerily similar. It just looked different Flacco-Watson. This is not an exact comparison. I'm just no, I drawing, get it, drawing the picture. The numbers actually say Garland and Mitchell together have produced really good results. A plus 9.2 rating is one of the higher <laughs> tandems on the entire Cavs roster. It's four games back. He's, he has to change how he plays, which he's played his entire career. He's always been the best ball you handler. You think that'll be a problem playmaker. for him? No, he's really talented and he can shoot. I don't mean the physical playing, part. I mean the mental part. I think anytime you ask someone to change Especially because he's is, an established star. Yeah. Mitchell's a bigger star, though. No so question. It's, it's not like he's being asked to change to a, a newcomer. It's not like Carl Anthony Towns when they drafted Anthony Edwards. No, you're right. You were the guy, and now you're not. I mean, Mitchell was always a bigger star than Garland was. But Garland has the requisite skill set to be able to play off ball and alongside. So we just have to hope Donovan and pray Mitchell. that he accepts that role. And we've seen it with, Mitch, uh, with Mobley and Allen. And there was one game, granted, small sample size, but the fact he took three threes at least kind of emphasized what JB said last week. Evan, we need you to shoot more threes. That was the first time all year, by the way, that he's taken It was three. the first time. And he's only, <clears throat> yeah, the first time. His, he's only made threes in f- three games this season. He had three against San Antonio. He made one against Indiana on October 28th, and he made one against Atlanta on November 28th. The only three games. He made five threes this season now. That's it. Well, what's, I mean, it, what's encouraging to me is it's his first game with double digit. Uh, you know, he, he yeah. hit more than one, so he hit, he hit three. And I think you're right. He got the memo. Oh, he saw it. it. Here's the thing that I love about this team. They're all smart. They all have a high basketball IQs. And when he was sitting and couldn't play, it didn't take him long for the light to go off. Oh, whoa, whoa. They're <laughs> doing something different here. Jared Allen out here eating. <laughs> this, this is He's different. eating today. And he's smart enough to know, and I'm sure JB has had this conversation with him, look, This is who we need you to become. And I don't care if you miss threes. If you miss, keep shooting. And we're not talking about eight a game. Right. We're talking four a game, I think would be a perfect number. Mike, am I off on that? How many threes would you like to see him take? Four or five? I mean, I think it depends how the defense plays him. I don't want him chucking up four threes if they're helping. But if they're going to sag off him and he has the opportunity to shoot three, four, five, I have no problem with him shooting open threes in the regular season. I don't either. If he's open, he should shoot it. I I think that's that's eight times, that's it. Evan, let it fly eight times. If it's once in a game, I don't think there's a number you have to hit. But if they're going to allow you to shoot those shots in the regular season especially – let it fly. Evan. Let it go. Let it fly. I, I, want, I want to go back to something he said about Darius Garland. You know, Mike said, like, anytime you ask somebody that's a star to change up what they do, it can cause an issue. If, if I'm Darius Garland, do I, want to be the, do I want to be the guy or do I want to be a part of a team that could possibly go to the NBA Finals? You know, I hear Jason Lloyd talk a lot about the Cavs really don't need to make a move. The Cavs have, the Cavs have all the pieces. They're just young and they need to grow. And I think, like, in sports, the same way we do in the real world, we worry too much about public perception. I right. think the best move to be made is internal. And I think that you need to shake up that starting lineup and possibly bring Darius Garland off the bench because, like you said, he's trying to figure out how to insert himself into this new style of play. Sure. Well, if you can bring a dude like that off the bench and then let him just run the show while Donovan Mitchell is getting a breather, I think it makes more sense. You know, up until uh, the game two days ago, I was a proponent of why not bring Evan Mobley and Darius Garland off the bench if it can work that way. Right. I just think, again, public perception, because one was the second overall pick, because one is a max player that most people will say you have to start these dudes. But having to start these dudes might not be the best course of action for the Cleveland Cavaliers. I like, agree with that. Don't worry about what, what the public say, what the <coughs> mass say. Gee, what do you say Do to what's that? best for your team. Because I'm all for that, I, too. It's I, just whether or not the players will embrace it. You know, that, that's a that's a, that's a, a thought-provoking thing because, like you remember you when said, Colin Sexton was asked to take a, he didn't a lesser do it. role? He could, he was like, He's no. up out of here. He was like, I don't, know, I don't know how I feel about that. Here's the thing, too. You know, if you look mm-hmm. at the way they play, <clears throat> what is the maximum – potential of the team when I when you see Jared Allen with 26 or Mobley with 28 and both to you one 10 rebounds 116 rebounds I feel like I if I could get that I'd take that over Donovan Mitchell and Darius Garland having 20 
five apiece. Oh, I would too. Because, well, because if you get, they're that, still going to eat too. Yeah, they're going to get theirs. If you could get, if you get twenties from them. Cavs is now a, a bona fide contender because now what you're looking at, you got two guys that can defend. You got guys that can that can finish around the rim. And now Mobley is is going to take that shot. We don't know if he's going to knock it down. But when you take a look at that, those two, it almost seems like it, it's almost telling the, the guys, hey, look, this is what we can do if we run through the bigs. Right. If we work through the bigs, it's going to make your life way easier. And I think Donovan Mitchell, he, 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 he's, he's cracked that in the matrix because if you watch him when he, when he started this game, he came out and it was getting everybody involved. He was like, we're not going to let Wimby get out here and get highlights and, and make you and make it feel like he's going to get off to a, a fast start. He got his big started fast and Wimby was on an uphill battle the rest of the game and Donovan still got his right. It was just it's just it's just picking your points and picking your time. Well, when, what's nice about that approach is when you get into playoff series and one team might be really good at defending bigs, then you come at them with the guards. What it does is it gives you other options yep. and different ways to beat teams. And we all know, even in a series night to night, a team will decide, oh, no, that didn't work for us in game one. Switch. So we're going to take this away. Well, if you're a team that has multiple hammers, you just hit them with the hammer that's working. And I love the fact that it gives them many options. Here's, I think, ultimately what it's going to come down to as far as Garland's concerned. Is he mature enough? wise enough and selfless enough to put the better good of the team in front of his numbers and his personal career. That's how teams win championships. When you look at those Golden State teams, they had guys that could do multiple things, but maybe one night, we don't need you to do that. We need you to do this. I thought Steve Kerr was very good night to night Mm. at finding out really early in the game what the other team was going to get him. That's he called best. a timeout at the eight-minute mark of first quarters. He brought his troops together and said, game plan out the window. They're, they're going to play us like this, so we're going to switch it up and we're going to do that. And they had selfless players, diverse players, and a lot of different skill sets, and they were able to beat you with multiple different uh, fronts, on multiple different fronts. I think this Cavs team, I, I do believe that the ceiling is higher if we get this version of Evan Mobley the rest of the way and Darius Garland can find his spot, I don't think we have to have them both on the floor all the time together. First of all, whenever Mitchell's not in the game, Garland's in the game. That's always been the case. But he's going to get those minutes. Maybe you start resting Mitchell more. They're in the three seed right now. You, yeah. And, and, and with Philly and a big injury that they've had, the two is within reach, and who knows from there. I, I just look at it like this, right? When we talk about the, the mental side of things, right? We know Darius Garland is talented, but you peep Darius Garland is not in the closing lineup of games. And, and I don't to, think that's by accident. It's not at all. And JB me, has realized what it is to me. That says a lot. I right? think that, that says a lot about who he trusts to get others involved. It says a lot about who he trusts as the leader, like just different things of that nature. You know, we, I hope it doesn't fracture the team. It shouldn't. It shouldn't. It shouldn't it, because if you're selfish, it has before. Like if you want to be either Dar- Darius Garland, you want to be known as that dude, All Star Max contract dude, or do you want to be known as that dude that's a part of a team that could possibly chase a ring? Like that's the question you need to ask yourself. Because if JB yes. Bickerstaff approach him and say, "Look, I want to shake things up. I want to try this. How about you? Could you be the sixth man? You come off the bench." You still get your 22, and 23 you minutes a game. you lose nothing with him off you the lo- bench. You the lose point. nothing. You actually gain because if you bring a dude like that off your bench and then the other team is making substitutions, nine times out of ten, you still got the best player on the court. You got a one against time. their two. <clears throat> and so, like, you got so many different moving parts and pieces to where I don't want to lose the role players and what they've contributed so far, right? Yeah. I don't want Sam Merrill to get lost. We're seeing Isaac Okoro play the best basketball of his career. Karis LeVert, when he's on, he's on. Yeah. And I just think shaking up the starting lineup, Jay, you don't need all four of these dudes starting. No, I agree. Like, Coral, it, it can would, make things better. Would Okoro be the guy that you would start McNuggets? If you did, this is theoretical. Uh, obviously, it's a long shot. I think they're going to keep him in the lineup. But would you go with the, the lineup would be Mitchell, Okoro, Struess, uh, Allen, and Mobley? Theoretically. I mean, I, I don't really care who starts. It's all about who closes. 
I but, agree with that. Right. I think we as the media make way too much of who the starting lineup is. I, I think the Cavs' best lineup, though, to close includes Darius Garland. You do? Yeah. I, I think Darius Garland, if you were asking today, game seven today, probably not. Yeah. But he's been back three or four games. He's still okay. trying to figure no, out how fair. he fits in. That's I think fair. for the Cavs to be at their best, Garland and Mitchell are playing together, and then you can figure out the shooting. Okay. Anxious to see. I got De'Aaron a Fox is coming Two, to town. Yeah, great uh, game tonight, by the way. Yeah, I, I got a question though for you, Shoot. Mike. Does it bother you that he only shot the ball three times in 23 minutes of play? Do like, you think he's moping? No. no. I mean, they were up big the whole game. Like, I have a hard time reading anything into a ball okay. out on a Saturday night against San Antonio in a non-conference game. I, I didn't think it was a big deal. All but right. they won by 22. Let's see, how, let's see what happens. <clears> and throat> what happened at the end of the game is a bigger deal. I'll tell you about that in one I second. Agree. I threw shark bait to the chat, and I asked, is Evan Mobley a shooter now? 66% said no. So shout out to the chat. They're smart. For being they real. We appreciate that, that from the chat. Always intelligent stuff from the chat there. We're gonna